surplus labor, desperate for work, and unwilling to challenge the bosses in the hope that they will retain a job is the bulwark of capitalism. The radicals such as the industrial workers of the world or Wobblies founded by Mother Jones and Big Bill Haywood in 1905 were destroyed by the state. Department of Justice agents in 1912 made simultaneous raids on 48 IWW meeting halls across the country and arrested 165 union leaders. 101 went to trial, including Big Bill Haywood, who testified for three days. One of the union leaders told this to the court. You ask me why the IWW is not patriotic to the United States. If you were a bum without a blanket, if you had left your wife and kids when you went west for a job and had never located them since, if your job had never kept you long enough in a place to qualify you to vote, if you slept in a lousy, sour bunkhouse and ate food just as rotten as they could give you and get by with, if deputy sheriffs shot your cooking cans full of holes and spilled your grub on the ground, if your wages were lowered on you when the bosses thought they had you down, if there was one law for Ford, Sewer, and Mooney, and another for Harry Thaw, if every person who represented law and order in the nation beat you up, railroaded you to jail, and the good Christian people cheered and told them to go do it, how in hell do you expect a man to be patriotic? The Wobblies once led strikes involving hundreds of thousands of workers and preached an uncompromising doctrine of class war. And the Wobblies went the way of the passenger pigeon. The Socialist Party in 1912 had 126,000 members, 1,200 office holders in 340 municipalities and 29 English and 22 foreign language weeklies along with three English and six foreign language dailies. It included in its ranks tenant farmers, garment workers, railroad workers, coal miners, hotel and restaurant workers, dock workers and lumberjacks, and it too was liquidated by the state. Socialist leaders were jailed or deported. Socialist publications such as the masses and appeal to reason were banned, and the assault aided later by McCarthyism, has left us without the vocabulary to make sense of our own reality, to describe the class war being waged against us by our corporate oligarchs. And it has left us without the radical movements that, as Howard Zinn made clear, opened up all of the spaces in American democracy. We will regain this militancy, this uncompromising commitment to socialism, or the system the political philosopher Sheldon Wolin calls inverted totalitarianism, will establish the most efficient security and surveillance state in human history and a species of neo-feudalism. And we must stop pouring our energy into mainstream political campaigns because the game is rigged. We will rebuild our radical movements or we will become hostages to the capitalists and the masters of war. Fear is the only language the power elite understands. This is a dark fact of human nature. It is why Richard Nixon was our last liberal president. Nixon was not a liberal. He was devoid of empathy and lacked a conscience, but he was frightened of movements. And you do not make your enemy afraid by selling out. You make your enemy afraid by refusing to submit, by fighting for your vision, and by organizing. 
for it is not our job to take power. It is our job to build movements to keep power in check. You get freedom by letting your enemy know that you'll do anything to get your freedom, then you'll get it, Malcolm X said. When you get that kind of attitude, they'll label you as a crazy Negro or they'll call you a crazy nigger. They don't say Negro. Or they'll call you an extremist or a subversive or seditious or red or radical. But when you stay radical long enough, and get enough people to be like you, you'll get your freedom. So don't you run around here trying to make friends with somebody who's depriving you of your rights. They're not your friends. No, they're your enemies. Treat them like that and fight them, and you'll get your freedom. And after you get your freedom, your enemy will respect you. And I say that with no hate. I don't have hate in me. I have no hate at all. I don't have hate. I've got some sense. I'm not going to let anybody who hates me tell me to love him. <laughs> Malcolm X far more, I'm afraid, than Martin Luther King understood America. The New Deal, which is Franklin Delano Roosevelt, a charter member of the oligarchic class said saved capitalism, was put in place because socialists were strong and a threat. The oligarchs understood that with the breakdown of capitalism, something I expect we will witness in our own lifetimes, there was a real possibility of a revolution. They were terrified they would lose their wealth and power. Roosevelt, writing to a friend in 1930, said, there was no question in my mind that it is time for the country to become fairly radical for at least one generation. History shows that when this occurs occasionally, nations are saved from revolution. In other words, Roosevelt went to his fellow oligarchs and said, hand over some of your money or you will probably lose all of your money. And his fellow capitalists complied. And that is how the government created 15 million jobs, social security, unemployment benefits, and public works projects. The capitalists did not do this because the suffering of the masses moved them. They did this because they were scared. And they were scared of radicals and socialists. We must stop looking for our salvation in strong leaders. Strong people, as Ella Baker said, do not need strong leaders. Politicians, even good politicians, play the game of compromise and are too often seduced by the privileges of power. Sanders, from all I can tell, began his political life as a socialist in the 60s when this was hardly a bold political statement, but quickly figured out that he was not going to have a seat at the table if he remained one. He wants his seniority in the Senate. He wants his committee chairmanships. He wants his ability to retain his Senate seat unchallenged. And no doubt this was politically astute, but in the process, he sold us out. Jeremy Corbyn, the new head of the Labor Party, offers another example. He spent three decades marginalized, even within his own party, because he held fast to the central tenets of socialism. And as the lie of neoliberalism, championed by the two ruling parties in Britain, became apparent, people knew whom they could trust. Corbyn never made an astute career move in his life, and that is why the establishment is so frightened of him. They know they cannot buy Corbyn off any more than you could buy off Mother Jones, Emma Goldman, or Big Bill Haywood.
Integrity and courage are powerful weapons, and we have to learn how to use them. We have to stand up for what we believe in, and we have to accept the risks and even the ridicule that comes with this stance. We will not prevail any other way. As a socialist, I am not concerned with what is expedient or what is popular. I am concerned with what is right. I am concerned with holding fast to the core ideals of socialism, if for no other reason than keeping this option alive for future generations. And these ideals are the only ones that will make possible a better world.